In this presentation, we're going to talk about the Gospel of Mark. So we've already dealt with Matthew, and we already kind of got a grasp of the idea of the synoptic problem. But now let's jump into Mark. Now, you'll see we probably want to spend quite as much time on Mark with some of the things we talked about last time, because we've already dealt with those. So let's jump into it and see how it goes. So when we look at the Gospel of Mark, and again, you can go forward and look at these slides on your own if you want um, and see some of the pictures and the manuscripts on here. Um, but we want to jump into the idea of authorship first. Remember, authorship and date are two of the most important items, followed by things like audience and provenance and major themes and issues, and then also critical issues, which we'll talk about toward the end. So when we talk about authorship, the book of Mark, who's the author, right? We see the earliest idea points to a guy named, obviously, Mark. That's why we call it the book of Mark. That's why we traditionally um, put the author as Mark. So what external evidence do we have for that? Remember, external evidence is just evidence outside of the Bible itself. Well, um, the evidence tends to point that Mark is written in Rome and that it is heavily influenced by Peter. Now, where do we get that from? So, first of all, Papias. You saw him pop up when we talked about Matthew. Well, he pops up here, too. Papias makes a statement around 125-ish. Um, he makes a statement that Mark was the interpreter of Peter and wrote accurately, um, but not in order, whatever he remembered. So the idea here is that in Rome, toward the end of Peter's life, you have Mark with Peter, and you have Mark writing down the stories that Peter tells. So in church tradition, the idea here is ultimately that Mark is writing all of the stories. He It is Peter's gospel through Mark's lens. That is kind of the idea. It's a Petrine gospel through Mark's lens. Mark is writing what Peter is saying, but he seems, but this tradition kind of puts him as writing it after the fact. He's not sitting there listening to Peter and jotting it down. It's more he, he has heard Peter preach these sermons. Peter is preaching these sermons, talking about all of the things that he has seen. And then Mark, um, after the fact, is writing this stuff down. So is Papias all we have to go on? No. We also see this um, mentioned by Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr is another a second century writer, although he's writing towards the middle or late second century. And he connects the book also to Mark and to Peter. Now, if we look at um, if we look at the anti-Martianite prologue, um, this by prologue, this is simply something that was tacked on to the beginning of some of the gospels that is specifically written to kind of counter. Marcionite teaching. And what this idea, idea what this uh, writing does, is it connects the book to Peter in Rome and said that Mark was written after the death of Peter. So it also makes that connection to Peter um, and it makes that connection into it being written after the death of Peter. So Mark is writing it after the death of Peter. Clement of Alexandria, again, late second century, connects it to Mark, writing down what Peter had written, what Peter had said. So he's seeing Peter's sermons and writing it down. Irenaeus, again, late second century, same thing. Um, he's saying that this is written after Peter's death, but it has the, Peter's authority because it is witness from him. Now, just a quick note here. Why do we care so much about what these guys writing a hundred years later have to say? Well, because they're representing traditions that um, go much earlier than this, right? They're representing knowledge and traditions and writings that go way earlier than them. So obviously we would love to have something written 
um, from very close. We love for Mark to say, I am John Mark. I'm copying what Peter said, and here it is. We would love that. But what we do have is external evidence written within you know, 100 to 150 years, representing traditions that go way earlier, saying Mark is the author, and he is echoing or interpreting or presenting what he learned from Peter. Which is quite interesting when you consider that the Gospel of Mark is more critical of Peter than the other Gospels. The Gospel of Mark is quite, is quite critical. This is where you see Peter like not at his best in the Gospel of Mark um, and the synoptics in general. Um, but you see this kind of picture of the apostles don't quite get it. They come across as a little dull and slow to understand. Um, you see this generally um, in the uh, Gospels, in the synoptics, but in particularly in Mark, um, which would make sense, right? Um, if you're preaching, if you ever sit there and listen to a preacher, many preachers are often quite self-deprecating. This is, I messed this up, or I did this wrong, or I didn't, you know. So it would make sense to kind of have that mediated. Again, it's not a slam dunk, but it, it does make sense. Now, continuing on with internal evidence. So that's the external evidence. Pretty overwhelming view that Mark wrote it. And he wrote it with that Petrine perspective. But let's look at the internal evidence. Of course, we don't see, it doesn't say who it was written by. Remember the headings that are at the top of the gospel, according to Mark, those are external evidence. So those are dating to the second century, but they're not internal. So that's an early evidence that it was written by Mark, but it is not internal. So when we talk about internal evidence, the gospel is attributed. I mean, is um, anonymous. So why would the gospel be attributed to such a minor figure? That's the question we have to ask, right? So when we think about the gospel of Mark, we know it's anonymous. But the question that we're going to have to ask here is, why would a gospel that is so important be attributed to someone like Mark? Because if we look at Mark, um, Mark is a very, very trivial figure. He's not mentioned very much. Um, he shows up. He's going to show up in a couple other books of the Bible, which we'll mention. But he's not an apostle. He's not one of the big, uh, the big three or the big 12 or the main ones that you would think of. Um, so why would we take an anonymous gospel and attribute it to a minor figure? Well, I think the best explanation is because that's who actually wrote it, right? If we were going to attribute it to some, if we were just going to randomly make up who wrote it um, in the early church, we probably would have come up with a more grand figure, right? Um, now, yes, we have an association with Peter, um, but no one really says that it's written directly by Peter. They all say it's written by Mark. So kind of getting in to the internal evidence, do we have a reference to Mark himself? No. Some point to Mark 14, 51 to 52, which if you go and read it, it's this really weird passage where a young man who's not named uh, is running out in nothing but a sheet and soldiers after Jesus's death, I mean, after Jesus's arrest and soldiers come to grab him and they pull the sheet and he runs off naked. It's this really weird passage. Um, you don't quite know why it's there. Some have said that's Mark telling his own story of what happened to him on the night of Jesus's um, arrest. There's no evidence for that. I don't see strong reason for that. Um, but it's interesting. It's, it's qu quite the interesting passage. Um, a good amount of ink has been shed writing about that passage. It's interesting. That's all I have to say about that. Um, so more internal evidence that kind of fits these external traditions. Um, we have vivid details. Mark gives a lot of very strong details, um, which you would expect to see if an eyewitness wrote it. Um, some other information uh, from Mark is he uses a lot of Latin phrases. Now, granted, it's written in Greek, 
but he's using some phrases and some what we call latticisms, um, latinicisms, that kind of make it seem like, well, maybe it was written in Rome, which again is what the tradition says. It was written in Rome shortly after Peter's death by Mark, echoing things that Peter had taught. So other internal evidence that points to that and confirms that external story is that it explains Palestinian customs. By Palestinian customs, I simply mean customs that were typical of Palestine. Palestine is the area we know of as Israel, right? Um, so I mentioned this in my Matthew video. We see something quite interesting here where Matthew doesn't see the need to explain local Jewish customs that people likely would have understood. Yet Mark, writing to a Roman audience or audience, a Gentile audience, likely in Rome, he explains stuff. Like if he talks about a Jewish custom, a Palestinian custom, he goes into depth explaining it. So what do we get? So who are we talking about? Who is this Mark? Well, the most likely figure of this Mark is John Mark, who's mentioned in the book of Acts. Um, John Mark in Acts 12, it indicates that his mom had a large enough house to hold meetings for Christians. We see in Colossians, this John, same John Mark, um, he has he has Colossians. If we look in Colossians, we see that he's related to Barnabas, so he would have been very close to this early Christian circles. Um, so it seems like John Mark is probably uh, the individual we're looking at here, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit more about date. So we have the authorship, um, internal, external, seems to be indicating John Mark, which is a relatively minor figure, but someone that does pop up a lot. Um, and then we get to date. So kind of two key questions we want to deal with when it comes to date. So how is this related to Nero's persecution? So Nero has a great persecution of the Christians in particular um, around 64 to 68. Um, Tacitus tells us about this. He says that um, basically Nero was trying to scapegoat the Christians for the destruction of Rome. People are starting to blame Nero for the fires that burned through Rome. So he blames Christians and he persecutes Christians so heavily that um, even non-believers, even Romans who hated Christians felt sorry for them. And we actually know that also that Paul and Peter, the church tradition were killed in this persecution. They were killed during this time, 64 to 68, somewhere in that period. So the early church held that Mark wrote it shortly after Peter's death. We know that Peter died under the persecution of Nero from other sources. So that kind of gets us in dating. If we take that view, it kind of gets us in dating around 64 to 68. So the gospel does reflect hints of persecution and apprehension about persecution. But again, we have to say, what do we mean when it says it reflects those, those apprehensions about persecution? Um, it is telling a story about what happened in the late 20s, early 30s. So I would just say be careful when we say something like that. Oh, it, it represents hints of persecution going on in the 60s. I'm a little hesitant there, um, but yeah, could be. Um, but I do think it is quite compelling to see you have this external evidence about dating pointing to um, the Neronian persecution of the church. So next, what's the next key question here? How does it relate to the Jewish revolt? Remember in the Matthew video, talking about the Jewish revolt and specifically the destruction of the temple. So we have the Jewish revolt kicking off around 66 AD, and then we have the destruction of the temple happening around 70 AD. And then some the next four years, you have some mopping up of um, the fortress in Masada and some other 
places in that revolt. But the key date is starting around 66 AD and then going into 70 AD where you have the destruction of the temple. So we have the Neronian persecution, which we have external evidence pointing towards, and then now we have the destruction of the temple. If you remember in my Matthew video, I talk about this also. Um, this kind of, all the synoptics, this issue comes up. So the book doesn't specifically mention the destruction of Jerusalem as a past event. Um, around about chapter 13, um, you see a similar discussion about the prediction of the destruction of the temple. Some point to this and say the destruction of the temple happened in 70 AD. Therefore, this was written after 70 AD because it predicts it. Again, I have a whole speech about that in my Matthew video, so I'm not going to get into that here. Suffice it to say, I think it's a weak argument that I think it's very reasonable for us to say that Mark, and Matthew for that matter, could have been written prior to the destruction of the temple because it's a prediction. Jesus is predicting that it happened. Um, from a Christian perspective, obviously that's not a problem, but even from a non-Christian perspective, um, that's not that much of a problem. So looking at dating, let's look at some other issues related to dating. Peter is not known to have been in Rome um, until around 62. He's not, um, he's not mentioned uh, in the prison epistles um, or in Rome. So it seems to me that Peter is after 62. Um, so we don't have Peter earlier there. So if we if we take our external evidence that says that this happened, uh, that most of this teaching occurred in Rome and that it was written after Peter's death, that puts us after 62, right? Um, also, if we look at this idea of Mark and priority, um, if Mark was written first, and all roads point to after 62, sometime between 64, sometime after 64, because that's where the Neronian persecutions where Peter died happened. Then all of a sudden, this idea of Mark and priority happens, right? Because whatever, if Mark was written first, wherever we put Mark, every other date follows, right? So if we put Mark at 64, 65, maybe 66, then where does that put Luke Acts? Where does that put Matthew? All right? Because in the synoptic problem, most would argue that Mark was written first, and then you have Matthew and Luke. Okay? So where does all this, how does all this work out? Now, your textbook, Lay, he tends to date Luke, Luke Acts around after 62, around 62-ish, around there. Um, for issue, for reasons we'll get to later. So because of that, he has to put Mark earlier. He has to put Mark to the late 50s, which again is a bit of a problem with the evidence that says. Peter died in 64, 65, and this was written after Peter. Okay, so that, that's the struggle there. So when we talk about dating, I do think we have strong evidence for after 64, 65. Um, however, I would say um, if we put Mark being written around 66, 67, 68, um, that does affect dating of other things, right? So we have to we have to wrestle with that. Okay. Um, I think it is appealing to want to put Mark earlier, around the late 50s, um, because of Acts, which we'll get into later. But there is a you know, there is a struggle there. You have to deal with the external evidence talking about Peter. I definitely think we can date. Mark before 70. Um, so, so just to understand, there's no cut and dry answer here. Um, your textbook puts it late 50s. Um, I think we have a strong argument to say 65, 66, 67. 
Um, but you're going to read a lot of things that will put it around 69 or 70. That's a pretty strong, that's a pretty common view, 69, 70, because of that idea of the temple destruction. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. So where where is it written? I mean, Rome seems to be pretty strong here. You can read the different the different things here, but a lot of things put um, Mark going to Rome. Um, you see a lot of different things. I mean, you even you even see if we go into Timothy, Second Timothy, we even see towards the end of Paul's life him saying, "Hey, bring bring Mark here. He's useful to me." So, so you see a lot pointing here. I'm not going to go into all the different details because we've kind of already touched on them. Um, but you see a lot pointing to Rome, turning external evidence. In terms of audience, same things we've already talked about, right? Mark explains a lot of Gentile. He explains a lot of Jewish things, to you know, which indicates it's a Gentile audience. Why does he feel the need to explain Jewish tradition? Um, he translates Aramaic phrases. Um, again, instead of just presenting them in Greek, he'll say it in Greek, transliterate it, and then he'll translate it. And this means this, right? Again, he, would he find it necessary to do that to a Jewish audience? Probably not. Um, possibly, because you do have a lot of Jews that Greek is their primary language. Um, but it seems a little less likely. So also Rome is suggested as the place. So of course the audience is going to be Jewish and it really fits and makes sense. Now, occasion of purpose, why was it written? What's the whole purpose of Mark being written? Well, one is, you know, there seems to be a threat of persecution. So, it, so this would be a quite encouraging book for those going through persecution. Um, also, uh, people like Peter are dying now. So there's going to be a push to say, man, all of the eyewitnesses are dying. We need to write this stuff down or we're going to lose it forever. Um, so there is a push towards let's write things down. Let's preserve this oral tradition. Um, also, there's a, you know, there's a purpose. There's a, a desire to phrase and frame Jesus as being the son of God to clarify Jesus's teachings. So these are all important things, important reasons here. So here is your outline. I'm not going to go in this. You can go back and look at this outline if you would like and uh, and see that. So key features of Mark. So what are, what are the kind of key features? What are the things that make Mark unique? Well, one thing that makes Mark unique is that he's extremely fast paced. There's this one word immediately that happens over and over and over and over again. And this is often seen as a rhetorical feature, a narrative feature of the book of Mark. He is very fast paced. It's, and then he did this, and then he did this, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately. Um, you almost feel like when you're reading the book of Mark, it's quite short. You almost feel like you're being rushed. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. He doesn't usually camp out for a long time. It's almost like the Cliff Notes version of uh, Matthew and Luke. Which, if you're Mar Matthew in priority, you really like that analogy. You really like that comparison. Um, that's exactly what you believe. It's the Cliff Notes version. Um, if you're Mark in priority, it's this is the shorter, down and dirty, quick, fast paced version that then Luke and Matthew expand on later. So it's also very emotional. There's a real focus on the emotions. Um, of Jesus, but there's also a real focus on Christology, the fact that Jesus is the son of God, um, and really emphasizing that reality, that he's doing things that only God can do. Um, so the big thing is he's the suffering son of God. He is the son of God. He is doing things that only God himself can do, controlling the winds and the waves and healing and forgiving sins and doing these things, but also suffering. Now, critical issues. Critical issues, this is a term you'll see thrown out um, by biblical scholars a lot. Critical issues just refers to the issues that scholars like to argue about. It's kind of a quick way of explaining that. What do we as scholars like to fussy with each other about and write papers about and present at conferences about? 
What are the critical issues? Well, the biggest critical issue for Mark has been and will be for a long time the ending of Mark. Because if you get to the ending of Mark and you're reading your Bible, um, unless you're reading the King James Bible, you're going to get to this these little asterisks or a footnote or maybe brackets that are going to say verses 9 through 20 are not in the most reliable manuscripts. Now, that's a bit of a simplification because um, you have to answer the question, what makes a manuscript reliable or not reliable, right? Um, we have some quite early manuscripts um, that have the long ending of Mark. Um, our earliest do not have it, but we have some that are pretty early that have the ending of Mark, this long ending of Mark. So why? Why is it that some manuscripts omit these last verses and some include it? That's a pretty big deal. And if we read the book of Mark, um, it's kind of weird. If it ends at verse 8, if we read the book of Mark and we get to chapter 16, verse 8, it just says, and the women left scared and they said nothing to anyone. They didn't say anything because they were terrified, right? And it leaves you kind of like, uh, well, we got the word somehow. So the tomb is empty. They, they had this encounter. They didn't tell anybody like what's going on. They had to tell someone. So, so here's the question. Um, what's going on here? All right. So first of all, what's the evidence that suggests maybe it's not original? What, what's the evidence that suggests that? Well, first of all, you have some changes. Um, between verse 8 and verse 9, you see a focus change. Um, also, if you if you look, um, you'll see some of the same material mentioned. Um, it, it's a little crazy. Also, you have different versions, right? You have a version where there's only, well, you get to verse 8 and it just stops. You have a version that we have verses 9 through 20. And then you also have a version that's got kind of a middle path, you know, that's only like a couple of verses and it's kind of an intermediate ending, right? It's a shorter ending. So you have manuscripts that have different ones and you have some manuscripts that have like all three, right? And they just kind of have it marked up that way. So dealing with this, what, what exactly happened? How did this happen? Well, some say that Mark was arrested or died before he finished. Yet, that's not really in the Christian tradition, right? It's not mentioned in Christian tradition. You think that that would have been something that somebody like um, Eusebius, the great church historian, would have written about, or something that Irenaeus would have written about, but they don't. So that, that view doesn't quite fit. The next is that the last verses were just lost and that somebody later on took 9, 10, uh, 9 through 20 and added it. OK, well, the problem with that is that assumes that they would have used a codex, a book like we, we have. Um, and that's a struggle because the codex doesn't quite take on until you start to see it get used a lot by Christians in the second, third, and then by the fourth century. It's really popular. Um, but it's likely that these books, the book of Mark, would have been written on a scroll, not a codex. So that doesn't quite fit, although books have been written making this argument. Um, and then also that it intentionally ended in verse 8. That's, that's become a very common ending, that it ended in verse 8 and it ended for narrative reasons. Jesus is resurrected, they're supposed to go and tell everyone, but they walk away and they're terrified and they don't tell anybody. How are you going to respond? Right? Obviously, they tell someone eventually, so there's no need to necessarily go into that. They're scared. They don't speak to anyone, um, but they got to tell someone eventually. And the idea is that, hey, um, how are you going to respond? That there's a rhetorical reason for this um so if you read the longer ending 
Um, most of the material is similar to what you get in the Gospels and Acts, right? So it really, really looks like, just to be totally honest, it looks like you get to verse 8, and for rhetorical reasons, um, the verse 8 ends. And it's an artistic reason for Mark. It ends, and it's left here and says, now what are you going to do? Um, are you going to walk away and not tell anybody? Or are you going to tell somebody? And are you going to be fearful? Or are you going to tell people? And then it looks like later people really struggled with this. Where's the ending? So they took the ending of Luke, the beginning of Acts, and they took the ending in Matthew, and they mixed all that stuff together in order to create a composite ending for Mark. There's nothing in Mark that is not in some senses echoed in, in Matthew, Luke, and Acts. Now, there's some stuff in there about being bitten by snakes that seems to take the picture of what happened to Paul. He got bitten by a snake and didn't die. There's some stuff in there that is doctrinally, the way it's worded in Mark is a struggle doctrinally. And there's also some other doctrinal stuff in Mark, for example, um, this passage in Mark talking about baptism. Seem, some have argued from Mark that baptism is required for salvation. You don't see that in the other Gospels. Um, this The wording in Mark could be seen that way. So there's some doctrinal things in Mark chapters, uh, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, that are problematic. And that has led many scholars, including myself, to say, we, you know, it's probably not original. Mark probably ended at 8, 9 through 20 were probably added later just to bring clarity. Um, and they're not we should not see those as being original and should not see those as being used to build doctrine. So that's Mark. We're going to get into Luke next. And I hope you enjoy. And I hope that you are able to take this and apply it to your reading of Mark to understand the book of Mark better.